Uh, today's title of today's sermon is called Sunday Show. In Korea, there's a show called Show, Show, Show. Today's title is called Sunday Show. If you could open your Bible, or if you can take a look at the screen, John chapter 4, verse 20 through 24. Uh, we're going to study from John chapter 4, verse 20 through 24. Okay, let's re read it all together in one voice. John chapter 4, verse 20 through 24. Okay, let's begin. So tell me, what is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship while we Samaritans claim it is here at Mount Gerizim where our ancestors worship? Jesus replied, Believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter where you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship. While we Jews know all about him, for salvation comes through the Jews. But the time is coming. Indeed, it's here now. When true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. For God is spirit. So those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. As I mentioned earlier, uh, wow, the, the praise was really a blessing to me, and I hope it was a blessing to all of you. And I want to just, you know, I hope all of you guys know and recognize that the praise team works really, really hard. And sometimes, you know, you know I don't want to say it this way, but it's not to put on a good show. Uh, they practice hard each and every week because they really want every one of us to come and experience God. And they want to do their part and do their best to make that happen. And I also want you to know that as your pastor, that it is my goal each and every week from Monday through uh, you know, Saturday, even Sunday morning, you know, my hope and my thoughts are always on what can I do to make sure that everyone that comes to church on Sunday, that they will come and experience God. But it's more than that. I want all of you to experience God. But I know that as a pastor that I have a responsibility. I have a responsibility to make the sermon as interesting as possible I mean, God's word is God's word. But I also have an obligation to make sure that you understand that it's applicable to you. And that when you hear, that you will hear somehow that I will not get in the way, but you will hear God's words through His Spirit. And also, maybe through humor, maybe through you know, sadness stories, maybe through jokes, but whatever means. You know, I want to make sure that you hear God's word and that you will remember and I will do my best, and I do my best to make sure that happens. But the reality is this. Not everyone gets blessed the same way. Some of you, after today's service, you will leave this place having heard God's voice. Some of you will leave this place maybe with tears in your eyes. I want you to know I almost cried during praise time. Oh, the, the songs that you picked was really wonderful. Some of you will leave here being inspired by God's word. Some of you will leave here with, you know, with greater passion. But at the same time, there might be some of you who will leave here thinking, well, okay, this is over with, done and over with. Now it's time to go home. Maybe there's going to be some of you that's going to leave this place thinking, oh man, I'm tired. I want to go home and watch a nice baseball game. The reality is this. We all come to the same place sing the same songs, worship the same God, hear the same message. But not every one of us leave here the same way. My point is this, how much we get blessed on Sunday, how much we experience God through Sunday worship, the onus, the responsibility, majority, most of it is not on me, is not on the praise team, but it is on you. Like I mentioned earlier, I do have a responsibility as a pastor to do my best to make sure the Word of God comes alive and to deliver it to you where it's practical and applicable, where you can understand. The praise team has a responsibility to sing the song as beautifully as possible, to reflect the glory of God. But ultimately, how much of it blesses you, it is up to you. Years ago, I heard a pastor say this during one of his sermons. And he, he, and he did not say this to his congregation, but he said it to other pastors. It was during pastor's conference. And he shared with me that, 
You know, there are certain words that he really doesn't like to hear after the service. Usually after the service, you know, the congregation and pastors, they, they meet outside, they shake hands. And he would say that many of his congregation would oftentimes say, come to him and say, Pastor, that was a nice sermon. Or sometimes they say, Pastor, I really enjoyed today's worship. And sometimes people say, people come to the pastor and say, Hey, the service was good today. Now, I don't know the intent, the, mode, the heart behind those words. But what the pastor is saying is this. Sometimes people come up to him, and the way they say it, and the words that they use to express their feelings, makes it comes across as if that the whole service is planned and exists, the worship service exists, to please the audience. They say things as if, like, okay, oh, okay, today's service, it was good, as if, they're giving their approval. Your message was good today. As if the pastor prepared all these things to please him or entertain him. I enjoyed your service. As if all these things we did, we do, was to simply entertain the congregation. Now, maybe that's not their intent. Maybe those words were you know, misused. But the message of the pastor that day was this, that too often people come to church and they have a wrong idea of what church is and what worship is. It is not to entertain. It is not for you. We, all, we don't do all of these things to please you. If we think that way, then we're missing the mark. Some of the things that this pastor said that he wants to hear after sermon is not necessarily, oh, that was a good sermon, pastor. I enjoyed today's sermon, pastor. But more than that, he said, I would rather people come to me and say, Pastor, God really spoke to me today. Or Pastor, God changed my heart today. Or Pastor, you know, I decided to change my life. He says those words better reflect what pastors hope for in the congregation's heart. Not necessarily it was a good sermon today. My question to you is this. What is church and what is worship? And what should be our attitude as we enter this sanctuary? You know, as a pastor and as a church leader, there's a real temptation to give in to everyone's wishes about worship service. You know, everyone has an opinion about worship. Let's make the songs a little too short. Let's make the songs a little too long. Years ago, I, went to a, I, I spoke at a retreat. I wor- spoke at a church retreat, and after about a couple of days, the church pastor who invited me shared with me that there's a big rift or tension among the congregation. It was a Chinese American church. And in that congregation, it was a church about 120 members, and about half, half the congregation was divided right in the middle. Half of them were 30 or younger. And the other half of them, believe it or not, were 50 and older. It was a very unique, dynamic, unique congregation. And the problem that they had was this. People on the praise team were mainly people that were 30 and younger. And they loved to sing, play the drums out loud, play the guitar, and sing fast-paced songs, stand up and clap their hands. While the other half, 50 and over, they wanted to sing more slow song, a little less loud. The hymns that many church members sing. And there was an issue. And the pastor confided in me, he is like torn in between. You know, they, everyone has a suggestion. See, we as a pastor, sometimes we fall into this temptation. There's this temptation to, to please and give in to everyone's wishes. Pastor, the sermon is too long. You preach for 30, 40 minutes. You can preach for 15 minutes a good sermon. Pastor, you know, let's make the song short. Or let's, make the, let's sing more afterwards. Why do we have testimony time? Can we make the worship service within less than an hour? You know, we as leaders, we... We want to please everyone, but we want to please especially God. And there is that temptation that we have to give in to everyone's wishes. There is this temptation that we face to make the worship service more entertaining. And let me tell you this. I try to make it entertaining, not for the sake of entertaining, but that's my personality. I believe that this should be a celebration. That's why I tease people. I tell jokes sometimes. But sometimes we fall into, we have this temptation to entertain out of pressure, to make the sermon interesting. 
Sometimes there's a real temptation maybe to compete with other churches. Man, that church, is, they have such a dynamic praise team. That church, is, they use such great PowerPoint presentation. That church pastor, oh, he's just so funny. And we have this temptation to compete maybe with other churches. And sometimes we face this temptation to maybe preach a message that's a feel-good message. What I mean by that is we don't want to say anything negative. We don't want to say anything that might be offensive. We just want to, we have, we have this temptation to maybe just say things like, you know, encouraging, motivational. You can do it. God will bless you. Even though that is true, that is not the entire gospel message of God. There's a real temptation not to offend you. Make sure that you come here, be comfortable, so that you'll come back every week. But this is the reality. The church, Sunday worship, it is not a show. We come here to worship God and not to be entertained. In the Bible, did you know that there are over 250 references about worshiping God? I mean, that's a lot. I researched and I read through you know, a lot of them. And wow, the Bible talks about worshiping God often. And when you read it, when you read those, some of those passages, these people are passionate about worshiping God. Let's remember this. God does not exist to entertain us. God is God. He is the creator. He is the source. He is the origin. He is the almighty God. And he does not exist to entertain us, but rather we exist for God. The passage that we just read in John chapter 4, it really talks about this core message about worship. It answers the, the basic question about church and what worship is. The chapter, this chapter begins where Jesus is traveling through Samaria. And for those of you, just to give you a brief background, Samaria was really like a, um, a ghetto. It's like, it's an area of Israel where, where it's kind of looked down upon. Uh, Samaria is actually a mixed-blooded people. I'm not going to bore you with the long story, but Samaria, you know, there were many conquerors, many invaders of Israel, and when they came and, you know, they would mix marry or, you know, have children with the, with the Israelites, and so they would have children who were not fully Jewish, and many of them lived in Samaria. So the Jewish people, they kind of looked down on people of Samaria, and oftentimes they would not travel through Samaria, they would go around it. But Jesus on this occasion, obviously Jesus being who he is, did not consider those things. So he traveled through Samaria, and while he was there, he was at the well, and he ran into a woman. And this woman, woman at the well, she was very shocked because the fact, number one, Jesus was traveling, a Jew was traveling through Samaria, and number two, that he was talking to her. Because in those cultures, men did not talk to women, in public at least. And she was surprised, and then this conversation came about in that moment, he says, so tell me, the woman says, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship while we Samaritans claim it is here in Mount Gerizim where our ancestors were worshipped? You see, the Samaritans believed, the Jewish people believed that Jerusalem, the Israelites believed that Jerusalem was the place of worship. In fact, some of the Jews actually believed that's the only place you can worship God. Now, Samaritans believe there was another place. That's why she's kind of debating. Why do you believe that is the place of worship place, while we believe this is the place of worship? But Jesus replied, Believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter where you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship, while we Jews know all about him, for salvation comes through the Jews. But the time is coming indeed, it is here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship Him that way. For God is spirit, so those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. The Samaritan woman says, you know, why is it that you have to worship there in Jerusalem? Why is it that you say, where we worship is not good? But Jesus' response is this, woman, time is coming where it will not matter where you worship. 
whether it's in Mount Gerizim or whether it's in Jerusalem or whether it's in India or whether it is in Korea. He said, it will not matter. Because you see, you see, God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And I'm adding this part. He's saying, what God is saying is this. Jesus is saying, is that it does not matter where you worship. The most important thing is that you worship him in spirit and in truth. The first thing that Jesus said is that you must worship him in spirit. Why do we have to worship him in spirit? Why is Jesus saying you must worship him in spirit? If you looked at this argument, and I mentioned to you before, the Jews had this belief that Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, was the only place that you can worship him. But more than that, even without, within Jerusalem, they said you must be inside the temple to worship him. And Jesus is clearly making a point of this when he said, God is spirit. And if you want to worship him, you must worship him in spirit. What, God, what Jesus is saying is this, God is not a building. Church is not a building. God is spirit. That means God is everywhere. God is in here. And if you must worship him, you must worship him in here. Not in a physical sense. You see, the Jewish people, many of them were very legalistic. And because of it, actually, many of them prayed often. They prayed throughout the day, and they were very faithful in giving offering. They faithfully gave tithe to the, to the temple. They gave money. Some gave 20%, 30% of their income. They were very generous. And to a certain degree, you say that is good, and it is. But in some ways, it made them very arrogant. They were very boastful and very prideful. They, had, they thought because they went to church in you know, a temple every week, because they studied, they memorized the, the, their Bible, they me memorized the Word of God faithfully, and because they gave offering faithfully, they were very prideful in thinking, we are better, we are more spiritual. God loves us more because we do these things. And what Jesus is saying is this. See, they're wrong, and so are you, but they're wrong too. You see, our God is not a church building. Our God is not a physical God where you worship Him physically. You see, our God is spirit. It is unseen. It is everywhere. It is in here. Therefore, if you want to worship God who is spirit, we too must worship God in spirit, in here. What I mean by that is this. Too often people think, you know what, I'm going to go worship God. And their mindset is, to worship God means I'm going to church. And it stops right there. There are other people, they think worshiping God means coming to church, you sit down, and you sing four or five songs, and then you read certain scripture passage, and then you listen to the word of God. And then after the service, you give the offering, and then afterwards, you go home. There are some people that actually believe that worship means exactly doing those things, physically coming to church, physically singing the songs, physically listening, physically reading, physically giving. Now, I'm not saying those things are all wrong. But what Jesus is saying is this, that is not worship. Because you see, our God is spirit. And if we want to truly worship him, we must worship him in spirit as well. That means true worship is not happening when we're sitting in the pews. True worship does not happen when we simply sing the words or give offering. True worship happens when we worship him in here. In here. Some of you might say, okay then pastor, then if God is spirit, that means we can worship everywhere, anywhere. That's true. You can. If you want, you can worship God in your home. In fact, I worship God in my car. I worship God in my office. Sometimes I even worship God in, while I'm taking a shower. You can worship God everywhere. But then why do we have to come to church? Because God said it is better to come together. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 20, it says, for, for where two or three come together in my name, there am I with them. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in a habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Bible tells us that when two or more believers gather, there's strength, there's power. God's presence is manifested even more. Hebrew chapter 10 says that he encourages us to gather together. Why? Because when we are gathered together, we encourage one another, we strengthen one another. And if you think about it, that is so absolutely true. 
even today, I mean, sometimes in my office when I listen to certain songs, pray songs, I cry, literally, I cry while listening to those words. But let me tell you, nothing blesses me more than when I come to church, when I hear other Christians' voices singing out loud, when I see praise team members lifting their hands, it encourages me. It strengthens me. See, when two or more are gathered, God said, my spirit will be there. In Hebrews, it says, when we're gathered together, he says, don't stop meeting together. Meet together. Because when you meet with one another, you encourage one another. You see, as Christians, we need one another. You cannot be a solo Christian. It's very difficult. It's very hard to live a Christian life throughout the week. We need the encouragement. We need the strength from one another. And that's why it says here, it encourages us to meet regularly. So going back to worshiping. So then, then how do we worship in spirit? First thing we must do is to fight off the temptation to make church or worship non-spiritual. We must fight off some of the temptations that we faced that draws us away from spiritual worship at church. What does that mean? Sometimes we're tempted not to come to church when we think that we're too busy. And we find, we find ourselves here only when it is convenient for us. You see, people that only come here when it's convenient, their understanding and their thinking is, well, you know what, okay, it's just physical presence, and they don't understand the significance, significance of gathering together and worshiping God. Another temptation that we have to face or fight off is to stay in the lobby, show up late, and please don't be offended, but sit in the back. We need to fight that temptation off. Why? We come in and we sit in the back. Why? Because we want to hide. We want to be inconspicuous. We don't want to be noticed. I understand that. But let us worship together. Let us be in the light. Let us not try to hide, but let us be open. Sometimes we're tempted to come late, so the church service won't be long. You see, the later we show up, the shorter the worship service. Do we listen to sermons only when the preachers, preacher is entertaining and tells us what we want to hear? Do we get easily distracted? Are we tempted to, to distract ourselves from doodling, maybe reading the bulletins, you know, when it gets bored, or daydream about, you know, the sporting events that we enjoy? You see, those are some of the temptations that we must fight off if we truly want to worship God in spirit. See, worshiping God is a spiritual activity. That means we need to connect God in here and in here. So how are we doing in that department? Are we connecting with God in here and in here? Or are we just going through the motion? We must worship God in spirit. And Jesus says, after that, you must also worship God in truth. Psalm 15 says, Lord, who may dwell in your sanctuary? Who may live on your holy hill? He whose walk is blameless, and who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from his heart and has no slander on his tongue, who does his neighbor no wrong and casts no slur on his fellow men, who despises a vile man but honors those who fear the Lord, who keeps his oath even when it hurts, who lends his money without usury and does not accept the bribe against the innocent, he who does these things will never be shaken." And Psalm 15 talks about how our relationship, how our heart is directly in line, related to our integrity, our honesty, and the truth in our hearts. This is true of every relationship. In marriage, people always say honesty is one of the keys to all relationship. They say that because it's, there's so much truth into that. You cannot have a deep relationship if you're hiding things. You cannot have intimate relationship if you're not sharing everything if you're not honest about everything. And that's what Psalmist is saying here. That we cannot connect with God unless we're totally honest with God. Totally, unless we're tr totally truthful with God. So what does it mean? How are we to worship in truth? Number one, 
The first step that we can take is to be honest with ourselves and with God about why we worship. Let me just say that this isn't, real, this isn't easy. Speaking truth and being honest is never easy. But we need to be honest and truthful about why we are here. One of the first areas that we need to be truthful is why are you here today? Within every church, there's a wide range of reasons as to why people come. Some of you come because your mother and father made you come. Some of you come because it is a habit. Maybe perhaps some of you come because out of reputation. If you skip church for some reason, you know, you're afraid of what other people might say. Some of you come because out of guilt, because if you feel like if you don't come here, you're wronging God. Some of you here because you're out of curiosity. You're here because, you know what, this is good service, this is the word of God, and you want to hear more. Some of you here because out of pure pressure. You know, some of you, your, your co-worker just kind of twisted your arm and dragged you here. But whatever it may be, what God is saying is this. No matter what the reason that brought you here, you will not, you cannot truly connect with God unless you're honest about your situation. Now listen carefully. I am not saying that you need to lie or fake it or make yourself, okay, I should be here because I want to be here. That is true. But the reality is not all of us come here for that reason. And to be honest with you, even as a pastor, we sometimes go through that as well. And I know that many times when I'm sitting there, other, you know, when I come to church, I pray to God and I say, God, I'm sorry. Today, I didn't feel like coming. Today, I am not in the mood to be loving to everyone. Today, I'm not in the mood to be kind. Today, God, I don't really feel like smiling or telling jokes. Many times I've come here and I've said that to God. And the reality is this, there's no point in me lying to God because He knows everything. But the reason why I say, I say these things and the reason why I'm so honest and open to God about these things is because simply I want to connect, connect with God and I know that in the end, no matter what my intentions were, when I come to Him in truth, there's a greater chance of me being blessed by Him. And that's not just between us and God, that's true for every relationship. You know, years ago, I, you know, I had, a, I had a friend, high school friend, and we were good friends in high school. We played I mean, a lot, and did, we got into trouble in many areas together. But then, you know, again, after I met God, my life direction changed. While my friend continued on his path, and he's a good friend. He's a very good guy. But what happened was that, you know, he he was in a relationship with a, a woman, a girlfriend, and she got pregnant. And so, you know, he tried to do the right thing and. They later got married. But there was, they still had a lot of problems, and eventually they end up getting divorced. And my friend, he never finished college because of that situation, because he had to work to provide for his wife and children. And years later, this was while I was a pastor. Years later, now I'm, I'm a pastor, and I, I met him. And you know, I would ask him, you know, his name was Ken. You're, you'll never see him. You don't know him, so I, I mentioned his name. I said, Ken, you know, you know, how are you doing? And the first couple of times that we would meet, his response was, oh, you know, pretty good, good, same old, same old, same old thing. Okay, that's good. And we part ways. And we, get, we see each other sometimes playing basketball. I say, hey, Ken, hey, what's up? How are you doing? Oh, not bad. Same, same old, same old thing. But what I didn't know was that all those times, he was going through this great pain and agony. I know that he was working at a, at a restaurant called Papacitos. If you lived in America, it's a very well-known chain. He actually worked as a bartender uh, because that was probably the best paying job that he could get without a college degree. And I remember, you know, I, I would visit him and my intention, my reason for visiting was because I wanted to, you know, invite him to church and I wanted to develop a relationship and invite him to church. And one day, and you know, I said, you know, let me come. And uh, I went there toward his, uh, between lunch and dinner. And there's always like a couple of hour break. And I went there, and I sat there. He said, what do you want for drink? Usually I said Coke. And he gave me free appetizer. And then I ate, and I waited for him. And afterwards, outside, I just kind of, you know, I said, you know, I, let's kind of talk since you have, you have a break. And he did. And, and I, we sat, and we sat on the actually outside on the curb. And I asked him, so what are you doing? What's going on? How are things going? 
And then he began to open up with, with me about his life. About, he's saying, you know, Paul, man, right now I'm just really messed up. I don't know what to do. I'm so depressed. I feel like there's no hope. I said, Paul, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm 30 years old. I have a wife and a kid. I work as a bartender. I barely make about, you know, $2,000 a month. But half of that money goes to my wife for child support. I barely have enough for my rent. So I don't know what to do. I feel like there's no future. I feel like, what am I going to do? Am I going to do this for the rest of my life? And at that moment, I, I said, you know, Ken, I didn't know. And we spent about next two, you know, two hours just talking. And then after that, let's, I said, let's meet again. And we met again. We talked and we talked. And I really encouraged him. I tried to give him hope. You know, why don't you go back to school? I even told him, if you want, I'll even lend you the money to go to the school. And we talked and we talked. And at the same time, I told him, you know, no matter what, I want you to know that the person that can best help you is God. I remember you and I used to go to church together in high school. You know, why don't you go back and give your life to God, which he eventually did. But the, my, the, but the point that I wanted to make with you is this. There's no way I could have helped him unless he came to me in truth. There's no way I could have, you know, prayed for him and thought about him and given him guidance unless he opened up. I cannot help him unless he opens himself to be helped. See, God works in the same way. Now, God can help, but ultimately God waits for us to open up our hearts. God will not force himself upon us. God cannot and God will not help us unless we freely come to him, open up to him in truth. That's why for me, I come and say, God... And I'm totally honest with God. Sometimes when I fight with my wife, I sit down there, I say, God, I fought with my wife today. I'm not in a good mood. God, I don't feel like worshiping. I say, God, but forgive me. I know that I have a responsibility as a pastor. Forgive me. Sometimes I come here and I'm like, praise him is singing, and, and my heart is just totally not into worshiping God. I don't feel like singing. So what do I do? I come before God and say, God, God, I don't feel like singing today. Oh, I'm just not in it. The words, it doesn't do anything for me. Why do I do that? I'm doing that because I know that when I come to God in truth, He will, He can bless me. See, worshiping God in truth means that we need to be honest with God about who we are and why we are here. If you don't know God, then be honest. Say, God, I don't know you. Maybe I even have doubts about you. Are you the true one and only God? I don't know. But be honest with God. To me, it doesn't make sense when people pretend. See, you can fool me. You can fool each other. But we all know we cannot fool God. And it doesn't make sense for me when people try to pretend and to fool God. It's okay to be here for the wrong reason. Let me say that. But the important thing is that you are here. And while you're here, let's be honest with God. The second step we can take is to be honest, be honest with God about ourselves. Be honest with God about ourselves. First John chapter 1, verse 5 through 10 plainly says, This is the message we have heard from him and declared to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word has no place in our lives. To be honest with God means to be honest about why we are here. But secondly, we need to be honest about who we are. Because it is only when we are honest with God about who we are, the Bible tells us that God can purify us. And Leviticus and Numbers talks about how God purified, cleansed the hearts of people. It's the only way that God can change our hearts, make us better, change our lives, 
is if we come before God in all honesty about who we are. What does that mean? That means we confess our sins. And let me just say there's not a single person in this room without sin. We're all sinners. We sin constantly. You see, the bond that exists between God and us, it is that, it is that thing that cleanses us and purifies us. See, faking Christian lives, it doesn't work. Living the way you want Monday through Saturday does not work. When we come before God, we need to confess our sins and then invite God to come into our lives so that he will purify us and change us. And just going through the motion each and every week, living the way we want, Monday through Saturday, and then come to church on Sunday, and same thing over and over again, that will not change us. That is not worship. That is not church. Most Sundays, I always say to you, you know, in order for us to worship God, we must worship God in spirit and in truth. And I always invite you to confess your heart to God. And the reason I say that and I lead you to do that is because as your pastor, it is my desire that every one of you, when you come on Sunday, that you will experience God. But before I close, I wanted to kind of remind you actually of what Peter, Pastor Peter Lee spoke about last week. Last week, Pastor Peter spoke about knowing God correctly. He talked about how our God is a good shepherd who's willing to leave the 99, most of his flock, just to go find us when we get lost. How he talked about how God looks at us like a coin, a lost coin, a valuable coin that he will go to the ends of the earth to find. How he talked about our God is like the father who welcomed the prodigal son, the runaway son, the rebellious son, after all the things he did, our God is a good father who waits to love, to forgive, and to cherish. He said, that is our father. See, for those of us who worship him in spirit and in truth, it's not hard for us. It's not hard to worship such an amazing God who is also an amazing father. And I want to encourage you that every time that you come before God, not just on Sundays, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to connect with Him in here. Don't be afraid to worship Him in spirit. And don't be afraid to worship Him in truth. Because He knows everything. He's just waiting for you to be honest with Him. Let's pray.